Bloop a doop a doo. Bloop a doop a da ba Hey, all you groovy cats and critters out there. Uh, welcome back to our channel. Today, Michael and I, Ramin and Michael, Ram Michael, are talking about Final Fantasy V. So as usual, um, we did a, a completely super anal retentive <laughs> chart that we like scored things on a scale of one to five and we've got combined scores out of 10. And it's too much uh, and it's way too granular. But uh, I, I like how looking at these all of these individual small points helps me come up with a better idea of what the big points are. If this is the first one of these video game reviews that you've seen with us, we've got it broken down into six big categories. Story, characters, graphics, design. That's a lot of design in this one. Sound, Sound and gameplay. Okay, so the first of the, these big categories is story. Even though it's an early game in the history of these sorts of console role-playing games, it's not that early. What I'm trying to s say with that statement is that even though it's an early game, it's not so early that the very tropey main premise of the game isn't already a trope. Like, the game is essentially find the four elemental stones, which we have heard even at this point a lot in gaming. And I do think there's a sense of urgency added to it, especially with the way that those elemental stones factor into the world's lore and affect the world and change the world map even. But when I think of the things I like about this game, story is not really up there. Even comparing it against Final Fantasies 1 through 4, 4 definitely has a stronger story, but 5 has a stronger story than 1 and 3, but that's not really saying much. I think it's probably about on par with 2, if not maybe a little stronger than 2. Final Fantasy V is among the favorites for many people, but I think most of the people who really love Final Fantasy V don't love it for the story as much. They love it for the gameplay, and that's totally fair. I see why, and I agree with them on, the, on that point. But the one thing that is nice about Final Fantasy V that is really not the case in many, if not any, of the others is it's one of the lighter tones in the Final Fantasy series. Most of them are darker than this. And it is it is kind of refreshing just to have, even though, you know, like lots of people die in this, <laughs> it's, it's villages, towns full of people die. It's still overall, it feels lighter, but I feel like sometimes that lightness doesn't always gel and it feels like shoehorned in sometimes like in one of the more recent installments of the playthrough review when we were talking about boko and coco and just like why did we have this much time spent to this animal friend that we basically forgot about the thing i like about this game is also what makes it difficult to tell a congruous story and that is that it really wants to keep that charming tone that like cutesy little smile and a wink there are a lot of smiles and winks in this game trying to maintain that while also telling a story about a world that is so much bigger than that is hard there is already a little bit of inherent tonal dissonance in cute little Barts and his cute little animal friends and also we're fighting a dude who can end the world. Other media does this. Think about like Sailor Moon. Sailor Moon is cute and fun and has world ending consequences every season. The story in that is often Usagi like getting her shit together. That's one of the main things that needs she needs to do toward the end of every season. Right, and I don't really feel that any of the characters in this, by the end of the story, have really, really have their shit together more than they did when they started. Yeah, I don't think any of the characters go through any character development. Yeah, I that, mean... That's the next category, but... <laughs> yeah, but that's relevant to story, too. Yeah, it is. As far as world building, uh, I felt that it was a little less cohesive than you did. When there were things that didn't seem to fit into something, in the, in the game's world. I feel like they were typically pretty well explained as to why that was the case. First, you go to another world and it, everything's different there and it feels different. But then you learn that these two worlds used to be one physical place together. Then looking back at stuff in the home world that seemed out of place suddenly makes more sense because it's a remnant from this other world that was broken apart from the first world. An example is the ruins of Ronka. Sort of feels like it comes out of nowhere in the home world. It's this, you know, these buried ruins that have all of this technical 
machinery and stuff like that. It feels technically out of place, but then you learn why that exists and why those are there because they're from the other world that stayed behind when the worlds were split. Even within one world, even sometimes within one town, the general knowledge and or perspective of the crystals and what they do and whether or not they're good is widely varying and not always in a way that feels logical. It feels more like the crystals are just this MacGuffin that the game designers made and and we like them because they're helpful with the environment, we guess. Although some of them like don't even seem to really, I, I think we talked about the fire crystal, for example, you know, doesn't seem to really give us much. Yeah, so, so Karnak is using the fire crystal as a big power source to run the fire ship, but having the fire crystal also seems to have put random fires all over the town and the castle and that doesn't seem like a thing that you want <laughs> right and also nobody really comments on that in any way in the town yeah so that's why i rated that a little lower because it's weird to me that we have this force that is important enough that the whole game revolves around it but apparently not important enough to like think about hi griffin all right so now let's move on to characters i think one of the interesting things about this game is that there are so few characters. Final Fantasy IV and Final Fantasy VI on either side of this game have way more characters each. Five playable characters isn't that crazy. You know, one and three each only have four playable characters. But I was interested that there are so few named villains who we could even talk about. There are bosses that you fight that have a line of dialogue before you fight them. But I was surprised that there were really only three that I thought of that do anything, that are not just there for one scene and then gone. Magissa probably, it really is just there for one scene and gone, but she at least has a little bit of a scene before you fight her. That lack of villains also speaks a little bit to what we were saying about the story feeling a little basic, because x Death is really the only villain besides Gilgamesh with any amount of meaningful development. I mean, yeah, Magissa has that like one thing. And x Death is just this, caricature of evil. He's bad because he's bad. One of the things that he has going for him is that he is actually the final boss and he's not as, he, there's no surprise final boss after him. Tractors. Okay, this is, that's a tractor, that's a tractor, and that's a tractor. I have successfully proven that I am a human. Part of my issue though is that the reason why he stays and the reason he's able to stay, to stay relevant as a threat to a party with this these abilities is because he's kind of all powerful and invincible until the very last encounter. Like he is basically a part of the fun, a Deus ex machina. <laughs> I mean, that's how he functions. Like every time we think we did the thing, oh, there's X death again. And who knew that he could shoot lightning out of his tits, you know? And he has no, like, consistent limits. And that problem would be solved if there were more named villains. Yeah, x -Death definitely does have plot armor, essentially. It is somewhat explained away that the party is able to attack him at all when the Dawn, or the ghosts of the Dawn Warriors and also the King of Tycoon show up to like zap him so the party can fight him. But like that also happens in basically every RPG <laughs> yeah. and every anime. Well, and it's like, if you assholes could have done this the whole time, why didn't you just... <laughs> well, they weren't Dude. that the whole time. Besides that, X-Death also has really unclear goals. He seems to change his mind. Like he's gonna rule the world and he's gonna combine the worlds. He's gonna rule the combined worlds. Then it's gonna get rid of all the humans so the monsters can live there instead. Oh no, he's just gonna actually destroy everything and then kill himself. He kind of is true chaotic evil if you view chaos as the plot line that the devs wanted to follow. We said in our playthrough review that we wanted Megissa to be more, and it would have been really nice since she does have somewhat of a personality. She's not working for a big bad. She's just doing this completely on her own. She's an opportunist doing what she can to make money doing anything. And it would have been interesting to have her as a constant thorn in the side, like for a while. It would have been nice to have her be like the home world foil to Gilgamesh, but she's just one and done and she's gone. Gilgamesh is refreshing and fun and also challenging which is, an, I think, an interesting combination. Like, most of the time in these sorts of games, if a villain is a joke in character, he's also a joke to fight. And Gilgamesh really isn't. What I like about Gilgamesh is that he's actually a sympathetic villain. I like the idea that he 
grows to really respect the party because they are an actual challenge to him and that doesn't exist elsewhere in the world. Um, and he just like does things for the thrill of battle, basically. It would have been nice if we could have gone into why he was working for X-Death at all, because it doesn't seem like he would be the type of person who would work for anybody. Like, I almost kind of feel a little sorry for him when he sacrifices himself for you at the end. That he says really misogynistic lines and anyway. The fact that he's actually kind of fun is one of the reasons why he has shown up in so many other Final Fantasy games. Bartz is, I don't know, I think of him kind of as like an everyman hero. I mean, in the context of Final Fantasy, he is kind of a novelty. He feels younger than some of the other protagonists in many ways, but I don't know. He's kind of a nothing burger of a character for me. My issue with Bartz is that he's almost written like a silent protagonist, but he speaks. <laughs> like, he's such an audience proxy, but he knows things that the audience actually normally wouldn't know. I typically don't like silent protagonists in games, so he's better than that, but what we do know about him is so little, and a lot of the little things we do learn about him, like, I just don't like. In the home world, we basically only learn that he's afraid of heights, and that's, like, the only character trait he has. As he starts to get to know the characters more, Galif tries to open up to him and talk to him about his feelings, and Bart shuts him down because right, right. men don't talk about feelings. That about scene is so weird to it me, It is too. very strange. But the one thing that really just confused the hell out of me, when you finally meet the sage, in my version, Gil, and in yours, I think it's like Guido or something like that. Yeah, Guido for me. When they get to the cave and Bart sees a turtle, he just starts, like, attacking the turtle that's just sitting there. And it's like, why? And then the other one's like, don't do that. He's the sage. And like, even if he's not, it's just a harmless turtle sitting there. Why are you fucking with this turtle? Don't be a dick. <laughs> Bart, hater of turtles. Yeah, apparently. So Lena is like one shade more developed than Bart's for me. Like she is the um, sweet sacrificial virgin of the game. Uh, that, that kind of trope and that sort of it. I do think the scene where she goes through the grass is moving, I guess, but also, like, there were so many other ways they could have just resolved that problem without that. I think in a way you could spin it in that she is, she's the type who would do anything to do the right thing, which is already kind of more character development than Rosa gets in Final Fantasy IV. It's not development, because she stays the same through the whole game, but it's more of a character than someone like Rosa has. I like that she's never really treated as a love interest for Bart's. In a less talented writer's hands, she would have been like someone that was there to be the pretty one that the hero gets at the end. Yeah, you know, it's funny when you say that, like I started this game totally thinking she would be that. A point to the game's credit. Yeah, I think it's implied at the end when Kryle is writing to everyone that the three of them are in different places. They, they have not stayed together. They're not close anymore, but they still share some kinship that they can get together and, you know, feel connected still. But, I mean, mutual um, trauma, yeah. At the very, very beginning of the game, the way that her character is written, I was thinking that she was going to be a good character. Because, like, uh, she's, she has agency right at the beginning. Like, her father talks down to her like she's just a child, but then she takes matters into her own hand to try and rescue her father. But then, as soon as Ferris shows up, they stop paying any attention to her. And then Ferris and Galif have all of the character development, or the, the things yeah. that anyone does. Which is even worse, because then when Kryle shows up, she's the only one that the game cares about anymore. Having said that, that is a good segue into the fact that Faris is definitely... I say Faris, I think you say Ferris. Yeah. But Faris is definitely, for me, the best player character. Like, yeah. it's not really a contest. She at least has something interesting living inside of her. She figures out pretty quickly that she is the long lost princess, Reyna, Lena's sister. But she also knows that she's had to build this double life for herself because a woman with a whole bunch of pirates wouldn't be taken seriously. But then at the very end of the game, if you go back to the pirate's cave, and talk to them. They're like, "Oh yeah, we knew that. <laughs> she, we knew that she was a woman, basically." Um, yeah, you know, I um, I also think while we're on that topic, <laughs> the game reveals that well, she learns that about herself too too soon. Uh, it kind of robs the game of an opportunity to drag out that development a little bit longer and explore it more because everybody has a major life event 
during this game. I mean, Lena loses her dad, you know? The loss of Giluf and, and Kryl losing that feels more important, or at least from the storyteller's perspective, than anything else. But I think that's because we as the player also care about Galif, where we don't really care about the King of Tycoon. We feel for Reyna and Ferris only because that's they are the characters that we feel like we know. In Kryle and Galif's case, we know we know both of them. I like Ferris. I also like Galif. Galif adds some comic relief and in a sort of flavor that no other characters really add. Uh, the kind of like doting older character, but his death does feel impactful, you know? It's kind of one of the few emotional moments in the game for me. Not just because I'm like, oh damn, I'm losing that character that I invested so much in, but because like it feels significant. But part of the reason why it bugs me too is that it's this pattern of characters sacrificing themselves at the expense of the plot and at the expense of x death continuing to be this threat that we just can't handle. It sort of accumulates the effect of things starting to feel pointless for the player. One of the things that I think is handled really well in his death scene is that after he dies, you just have like a minute of silence and you can walk around, but you can't talk to anybody. And it's just like, we just have to sit with this. That helps you feel like, oh, they're trying to make sure that I know that this is impactful and important. We lose other characters throughout the run of the game. Basically everyone else that is named that we know of from the other world dies. But of the other deaths, the one that feels the most impactful to me is Hydra, Ferris's dragon. Just because we at least know enough that they were raised together. They, uh, they, they feel like they're siblings to each other. And also, that is our means of transportation. Like, you are literally dead in the water without this dragon and without wind. The only one that feels even approaching the same impact as Galuf is maybe Zizat? Zizat? Shazat? I like Shazat. It has a little rhythm to it. Shazat. Mmm, Shazat. But Shazat. I just said it differently again. <laughs> Shay Shay. Um, <laughs> that death feels impactful to me mostly because of its proxy to Galuf and what it means for him. And the fact that, like, you were being assisted by his fleet and there may have been potential there that then is lost through that loss. But um, even that one, I'm not like putting up tissue box for. Well, that leaves Kryle. She's interesting. I, I think she's quite likable, but it seems like whenever they needed anybody to do anything, even before she's a party member, it's like, oh, let's have Kryle do it. She's one of those female characters that is kind of a trope at this point too, who like is just good at everything and also virtuous. Yeah, she's awesome. She saves her life multiple times. Most of the rest of the player party, I can at least find one or two pretty clear flaws. With Kral, it's like, I don't know, she's she's too young to inherit the throne now because she's clearly the most competent person. She's just sorry to be up, you know? Like, what else can I say? It's, to me, kind of wild, the sort of journey she goes on. Her character does not change, but the physical journey that she goes on. First, yeah. she rides a meteorite from one planet to another. She doesn't have the Dawn Warriors or um, the Light Warriors' powers. She doesn't have the Crystal's power, but she's able to shoot lightning from her hands anyway and stop X-Death the first time. When we see her next, she is at her grandfather's Perfect. side as a 14-year-old girl helping to lead an army. She can talk to animals. We learned that we should go see Gil because, oh, she gets telepathic messages from him, which also give her a bad migraine. Right. And that's partially also why I feel that X-Death is a cheap villain, because Sometimes he's too powerful for even Galuf. Other times, oh, I guess his Galuf's granddaughter can handle it. There's no consistency, and this kind of goes along with what I said earlier about lore and the world and cohesion. There's no consistency of like power dynamics and power levels here. One minute person A is a god, and the next minute, well, tough luck, kid. The plot needed you to dim it down. You missed a uh, power level is over 9,000 joke. And though she's kind of badass and fun, like, and we both gave her four out of five, I don't know how to describe her. Like, if someone asked me to describe her personality, 
determined. Exactly. Good. Capable. Let's move on to important NPCs. King Tycoon, he himself is not that important. It's more like how Reyna, Lena, and Ferris feel about him that's important. But I do kind of like that he's this red herring that we're chasing for a, a small section of the game. Like, oh, he was spotted in the desert, so we go to the desert, then you like follow his floating body around for a while. I think that's kind of interesting, but not enough to give him high points, really. Yeah, uh, he kind of exists as a foil and plot obstacle for Lena, really, and then after that, there's not a whole lot left to him. I do really like this game's Sid. I think he's one of the more charming of the Sids, and he has funny moments, but also there's some, some angst there with Mid, who I also like a lot. Yeah, I like that for a lot of the game, Sid feels like he's responsible for everything bad that happens in Homeworld, because he's the one who develops the equipment that can drain power from the crystals. But I also like that he somewhat hides that from the party for a long time. You end up having to find out sort of haphazardly after he's held it in for a long time. Yeah, if we were ranking Sids, he might be like two or three for me. Kelga doesn't really make any choices. No. The one choice he takes is to give up the last of his energy to help the party. Right. And it really does feel like Kryle prays for his death. Uh -huh. When they're stuck in x -Death's castle that has no exit she like wishes for a, a solution and he's like oh they need me i'm gonna die now it's a little bit interesting that the second kalga meets bart's he's like we gotta fight i wish the game had explored that a little bit more like oh yeah it's common in the werewolf tribe to use fighting to establish do dominance or something like that like, why else are you fighting this person that you just met? <laughs> Drogon, for me, is kind of a nothing burger. I know that he was worried about his wife. I know that he sacrificed himself to save the world. That's kind of it. We've already talked about Zeza, Zeza, Zeza. So that leaves Gil slash Guido, wizened older character who gives lore dumps. I would have liked this character more if we had gotten in one fight with him as a party member. Cause you're like, it, I felt like it was moving toward that. When, Cause when you meet him in the merged world, you have a party of three at the time. And this is when Kryle has X death living as a thorn inside of her, which we didn't talk about, but I think it's an interesting plot idea. If they had like went with that and let, had the thorn there for longer, basically it's just like, Kryle's just like, oh, I have a thorn. And then you get to the next spot and then X death is like, ha, it was me all along. If this had been a problem for her for longer, like, oh, why is this thorn hurting me so much or something like, and you had to like go on a quest to do something about it maybe or something like that. That would have made this fairly insignificant story idea interesting then. It's kind of a pacing issue if you really think about it. I feel a little bad about this diversity line in this chart because what games had diversity at this point? But I think it is still notable that every character who is human is white or appears to a white gamer as white. I don't know how Japanese players view these characters. I mean, there wasn't diversity because in this genre at the time, there wasn't diversity really, yeah. and, um, which sucks. But. And though usually when we're doing these scores, I don't always intend this to be looking with a modern lens. Is this a good or a bad thing? It's more like, how do you feel about this? And so I think it, with two different people scoring this, they might have given higher scores to this because, you know, it's just par for the course. They feel fine about it. But it is a little tiresome. Yeah. On and the other hand, though, gender parity is um, not bad in this game. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting that you end the, the game with one male and three female playable characters. We don't have a party makeup that is more female than male until Final Fantasy X-2. One reason I did ding a point in this category is some of those outfits for some of the jobs for the women are like, like the Mystic Knight is like a paladin type for the man and then a belly dancer for the women. Like I was thinking of that more in design, but I think that's true. But I also think that several of the outfits of several of the jobs are kind of racist. Not like hugely incredibly racist, but it's like, hmm, having the chemist and in my game that the Mystic Knight is called the sorcerer in, in my version of the game, having them in turbans, is that problematic? <laughs> you know, it's probably not. 
overall, but still, it's like this. It gives me pause. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I would say it's, it's worth pause. I do think it's worth saying in a game like this that is striving to be nudge, nudge, wink, wink a lot of the time. I don't need the characters to feel real, uh, but I would have liked a little more real than this. <laughs> if we had any moment of any of the characters talking about how they feel, we get a little hint of that with Gallif, and that's about it. We get it with Kryle. I mean, she's super sad about Yeah, okay, no, we, we get it the most with her, but I feel like, it almost feels like the game is not quite shaming her, but pointing out, like, she is a woman, well, she is a young girl. She is a 14-year-old girl. So it makes sense that she's sad that her yeah. grandfather died. Like, no, let everyone else be sad too. <laughs> As for dialogue, I will say the translation of mine was notably better. Another issue was that most people sort of spoke the same, um, with a few exceptions of like obvious beast races, like the Mughals. There wasn't a whole lot of variety of that for me. Yeah, there's the pirates. This really goes beyond translation and its uh, localization instead. And you have to work within the types of characters and classes and so on that exist in the zeitgeist for all of these Japanese writers and find a way to translate it to a way that makes sense to English-speaking people. Things are never really one-to-one -one with any of this stuff, but it would have been nice if there were some way to differentiate how people speak a little bit. So um, I was playing the... Um, PlayStation port as part of Final Fantasy Anthology, and the graphics are all, like, fine. They translated SNES graphics to the PlayStation pretty well, and um, everything seemed good. I had no qualms. Yeah, I played the remaster for Steam, which looks nice. I mean, it's definitely a better quality than I remember playing on your version, which is the version I have for PlayStation. But I don't know, I felt like they could have gone further with it too. I think the uh, Pixel remasters had a difficult needle to thread in being nostalgic and looking modern. I think aside from a full HD 2.5D like Octopath Traveler, aside from doing that, there's not really much that you could have done that wouldn't have made someone upset. And the HD 2D is much more time consuming to do. I don't know, I thought this game's design aspects were hit or miss in some ways. I definitely think the the, the look and feel of this game is unique in the games the series thus far, but beyond feeling sort of more charming and vibrant, I, I don't know, the, the design of the game doesn't feel like one of its, its selling points for me. Especially with character design, it to me seems like Amano was just kind of going through the paces here. None of his character designs really stick out to me except for Ferris. Like she looks cool as hell in Amano's original artwork, but the rest of them are just, to me at least, look fine. Nothing yeah. really seems like it's trying to do anything interesting or new. Well, and the funny thing is, whether we're talking about the Amano art or the sprites, really, these are less interesting than most of the previous series, especially the predecessor, Final Fantasy IV. I mean, I think some of those sprites are gorgeous, and, like, they all look very different. In this game, the player characters all just sort of feel like different hairstyles of each other. And the, the sprites sort of make no sense translating from Amano. Basically, none of them have the hair color that he does. Now, it's true that Amano does make all of his female characters blonde. It feels like any charm, which was less than usual, that was in Amano's design seemed to be a little sapped out into the sprite design. The one plus of the sprites, I think, is Ferris looking appropriately gender non-specific in her main sprite uh, in most of her jobs too especially that like the first crystals jobs all of her sprites look more masculine than feminine it's not until you get like crystal two or three or four that her sprites start her her job sprites start to look a little bit more feminine i gave king tycoon and zeza uh both fives because they actually look basically exactly like their amato designs there which i think is interesting yeah and I do think Zesat's, um more intriguing armor aspects are cool too. And Tycoon's like headdress and stuff. It's not really like, you know, even in Final Fantasy 1, right? The royal is like 
a dude with a crown, I'm the king. Yeah. But this feels a little more unique. Most of the towns in this game, with a few very notable exceptions, uh, feel homogenous. They feel the same as each other. Basically, aside from the towns that are clearly like in a high fantasy setting, like the Mughal Forest, like Phantom Village, aside from those, I don't know, to me, a lot of the towns feel sort of similar. When it comes to the Phantom Village, that's the kind of thing that I wanted to happen at some point in Final Fantasy VIII. To stretch out that last act just a little bit longer in the time-compressed world, have this town that has a few seeds live in it, living in it that are fighting against Ultimacia that somehow survived the merge, like the Phantom Village survived being pulled into the void. The dungeons in the game are also mostly pretty middling. There are a couple cool things here and there, like the ship graveyard, and a couple look pretty, like Istery or Easterly Falls. There are also some that are just incredibly frustrating, like Castle Karnak yeah. and Phoenix Tower. Um, I do really like the monster design for the most part in this game. X-Death is, his final boss design is surprisingly disturbing for what this system was capable of at the time. Like, I remember the first time he came out in that fight and I was like, oh god! I need to kill it with fire! <laughs> One of the things that I really like about the monster design in this game is that the monsters feel different depending on which world you're in. The monsters are more, you know, like typical imps and wolves and stuff like that in the in the home world. But when we get to Gallop's world, it's all these like weird mutants that I think I think that's a really satisfying thing when paired with the new world map music theme that it's like, oh, we are in a different place now, which I think is, I think is cool. Yeah, definitely. Uh, they built that atmosphere well with the monsters and the music. Transportation is better than average, but but still just above middling. Um, we've got chocobos, we've got ships that feel like they usually do. I gave the pirate ship a five out of five just because it's pulled by Hydra. The submarines are cool, the dragons are cool. Sort of like Final Fantasy VII, which I think does transportation the best of all the Final Fantasies, each different transportation option feels like a real reason that the party can only go to this place and not that place. When you finally get the airship that can fly over the mountains, you can't land everywhere. Um, when you so when you get the when you get a black chocobo, you know that can land in a forest where the airship can't land. So I like how Final Fantasy V does transportation from a design and gameplay perspective. I do think that the transportation in this game is quirky and fun, but honestly, my bigger issue with it is you kind of have. Pardon the pun, a ship graveyard by the end of the game because you have like, I just remember those final few hours of like completing my side quests and looking at all the little dots on the map like, wait, is that my chocobo or my other chocobo? Or is that my airship? Or we could have just given the player like an airship whistle or, you know, like yeah. a summoning stick for the ship so that I don't need to constantly like be managing my vehicles across yeah. the world. I'm surprised that they didn't like have the various ships commit suicide to protect the party like all the <laughs> animals do. I'm just picturing like a really heartfelt, tearful uh, scene with Ferris and her ship as the ship <laughs> sings like in sad music playing in the background. Right. Yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't put it past this game. But speaking of music. So we were talking about uh, how I feel like Amano kind of just like was going through the motions in this game. I kind of feel the same way about Uematsu. This music is not bad. Uematsu in my, as far as I know, has not written bad music that is widely available. But I feel like a lot of the ideas in this game, the musical ideas, were recycled in later games and done better. There are some things that are just straight up recycled, like Kuja's theme is in Final Fantasy V. It's the pyramid theme. It's a good theme in nine, but it is bad in five. <laughs> a lot of Uematsu's themes throughout all of the games feel closely related to each other. Like we've talked about how some ideas, musical ideas from six made their way into seven, how some things between seven, eight, and nine feel like they're closely connected. But I feel like five seems like the one that just got the short shrift. It's not surprising because he was writing music for a lot of games at this point, and there's a lot of music in this game. He didn't have as much help 
in this game as he did in later games. Yeah, I think the only reason I gave it a slightly higher score here than yours was is that my view was more like, even when it's not Uematsu's best, it's still good. I am the type of gamer I typically just keep the game's music on unless I really can't stomach it. In this game, even by the time I reach the last town, I'm still like, oh, it's the little... <laughs> I'm not singing in the right key, but you get the idea. What I do think is interesting is how this game kind of has a mono theme with the, the main theme of the game. It's used in several different tracks to mean different things. The la, da, 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 da. Yeah, that's true. It, 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 it does mean several different things depending on the orchestration at the time. And you've also been hearing my cover of it in the background of this whole video. <laughs> we were originally thinking of maybe going with the theme and trying to make like a noir themed video, but that's too much work. We're not gonna do that. I might make this in black and white the whole time. I won't, but I might, I won't. The music is good. Uh, I feel like it uses the available synth sounds at least passively well, but it's, it's sort of interesting looking at the games that were around this time, like before or after. Like the game does sound better than Final Fantasy IV in the sounds available, but it doesn't sound nearly as good as Secret of Mana, which is a year later. And that game sounds so excellent. Comparing against one of the best is not necessarily fair, but also Uematsu is one of the best, so. But I do think one of the best, maybe even the best aspects of this game is the gameplay, which is our final category. I have played a lot of these remasters, and this one makes it easier to play through this game, but not as easier as some other remasters have. But even though these older games can be tedious sometimes, I thoroughly enjoyed playing the game, to be, to be honest, with a few notable exceptions we've talked about in the write-ups, like some bosses that are really a lot. But it's fun. Uh, I really enjoy grinding in this game uh, because it offers so many different and equally good rewards. A lot of the times I was just grinding because I wanted to find out what the bard's next ability was that I could tack onto that character with something else. It's impressive, this job system, the number of ways you can combine and strategize that are um, in many cases equally legitimate until about like the midway point of the game where really without certain tools, like, and this is one fault I have with the gameplay. There are some fights that without like rapid fire, for example, or the or barrage, I think that you said it is in your game, something. S -shot. Quick shot. S shot, yeah. But like without some of those clearly superior job abilities, a lot of the late game would be unplayable in my opinion. Yeah, and it's it's sort of weird how so many of these like OP abilities are locked in jobs that you wouldn't really use otherwise. Like I would never be a hunter unless yeah. I knew that I wanted to get S shot. Um, well, and all the game's bow and arrows are worse weapons than like the swords, for example. Yeah, the dancer class is not really super useful in this game. Bard is surprisingly useful in this game. But yeah. um, the dancer class is not really super useful, but once you master dancer, you can equip the, the ribbon on whoever you want. Which is so dumb to me. It's a really fun game to play and comparing the job system in Final Fantasy V against Final Fantasy III, like Final Fantasy III, gives you all these jobs, but for the most part, if you're not using the most recent job you got, you're not going to win the battles. And if, you, if you're not leveled up enough in the most recent job you got, you're not going to win battles. Conversely, in Final Fantasy V, like the Black Mage, which you get from the first crystals, stays a useful job until the end of the game, which I like. For the most part, you can make a viable party out of any jobs. Overall, gameplay good. Mm -hmm. Good game. Although I will say, notably, that I don't think I want to play it again for a long time, if ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not one that I'm itching to go back to, but I think it's because you and I both as gamers are more drawn <coughs> to story and character development than we are to gameplay. And like, all of them are important to some degree. Like, you can have the best story in the world, but if the gameplay is shit, then I'm not going to play it. For me, like as long as the gameplay is good enough, then I'm going to pick the game that has the best story and characters typically. All right, so any final thoughts on anything in the game? All I really have to add is I did enjoy it more playing it again than I did the first time I when I was like, I think 13 or something and I gave up. I enjoyed it more than I thought I would. It moved up on my like ladder of 
favorite to least favorite Final Fantasy games. I'm not sure exactly where I'd put it. It's definitely like somewhere in the middle of the pack for me. Definitely not a bad game. I feel the same way. And I feel like even beyond just replaying these older games, the ones that you and I or just I have done playthrough reviews of that like I'm really engaging with the game while I'm playing it. And even if I'm finding things I don't like about it in my analysis, uh, it's making me engage with the game more, which is making me enjoy it more. I also think this game is overall middling, but I also acknowledge that if you are a person who likes endless customizability in your games, then this might be the Final Fantasy game for you. I was thinking out of 100 of giving this game an 81, you just said 78 at the beginning of this call. Um, is that still what you're thinking? Actually, I think I would lower it down to 75. Okay. So with the scores, the, the the picky scores that we gave, that the score the game gets a 68%. I gave it an 81. Ramin gave it a 75. That brings the total score altogether to 75, which I think is fair. That is a C. Okay. Well, that's it for Final Fantasy V, the game that we thought we would hate, but we ended up liking a lot more than we thought. Uh, that was a long and complicated and bad sentence. I don't think I thought I'd hate it, but I didn't think I would like it as much as I did. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for watching. Uh, I hope you enjoyed our discussion. Let us know your thoughts. Let us know what you agree with, what you don't agree with. What do you like or dislike about this game? Yeah, give this video a like. Please follow us. Please leave a comment. Interaction is both good for the channel's metrics, but also fun for us, because then we sort of get to learn a little bit more about what you're thinking. And good for your heart. Yeah, thanks for watching, and maintain your groovy selves. We'll see you next time.